In today's show, we're talking Philadelphia 76ers with one of the hosts of the Lost On, Lo, not Lost On, Locked On Philadelphia 76ers podcast, Devon Givens, Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and at Yahoo Sports Australia. And you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore Beeble and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Thank you for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms. Of course, I, have, I, I think I've mentioned it in one of the earlier shows today about Kevin Durant and the trade that isn't him staying put with Brooklyn. It obviously does help some of his fantasy value. We're going to talk Nets later on in the week, um, but it just gives some certainty more to guys in Phoenix, to guys in Boston, a little bit more in Miami as well. And yeah, really, yeah, it does help that certainty of Durant in um, in Brooklyn. Yeah, more so now that you look at him as a top three pick without too much concern. I would have thought in fantasy leagues, but we'll talk more about that when we talk nets and when we get into mock drafts and things of that nature. We are going to bring in Devon in just a second. So, Warney. Let's get it on, Gilly. <laughs> All right, let's bring him in now for the first time on Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Devon Givens, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much, Josh. Thanks for having me. Very excited to be here. We're going to talk Philadelphia 76ers. Uh, a lot to get through, a lot to talk about. Let's start where I've started all of these shows, Devon, by looking at who is uh, who has joined the team, who has left the team. They bring in DeAnthony Melton, PJ Tucker, Daniel House, and then there's Julian Champagne and Trevelyn Queen. They lose Danny Green, DeAndre Jordan, and Paul, Paul Millsap. And I would say, Devon, that those three guys out, Danny Green is really valuable. He was going to play zero minutes this season. They lost... They, they lost nothing, really. Yeah, for, for me, it, Danny Green was it. And Paul Millsap, DeAndre Jordan, thank you so much for your services. We appreciate it. But it, it's time to move on and, and, and get younger and more serviceable people to come in and help out. And those backup minutes were really, really important behind Joel Embiid and having now Jordan out, Millsap. While you haven't necessarily replaced him, you like the idea of Paul Reed, maybe even Charles Bassey a little bit, possibly trying to get some regular season minutes to see if they can even – Josh compete in the postseason, but uh, bringing in Melton and Tucker, House, Champagne, and Queen, who are two players that will have to make the team, nothing really guaranteed for those particular players, but Melton, Tucker, House, they've really been the talk of the city as far as what they can bring and help out add to the 76ers. So we'll talk about this soon, but Tucker's going to slide into the starting line. But a lot of people in the fantasy community, they're really excited about DeAnthony Melton. And they always are because he's one of those guys who puts up ridiculous numbers in limited minutes. So he's going to come off the bench. I think we're all well aware of that. But the, the question that I guess we're going to have is, what does his role look like in comparison to, say, Matisse Thibel, who also is going to come off the bench? Because Melton was in a situation in Memphis where he's just get 22 minutes, 22 minutes, and it would frustrate people continually. Is he going to be 22 minutes again? Is he going to be the undisputed sixth man who might push to 27? What do you see his role as on this team? Well, I think he's going to be outside of Tyrese Maxey being the backup point guard, if you will, because what a lot of Josh Doc Rivers did was he had the uh, two-man rotation of subbing in and out, keeping the two stars two stars on the floor at all times. So it would be Tyrese Maxey staying on with Joel Embiid, James Harden, and Tobias Harris exiting the floor at the same time. So uh, when, you, when you had that and, and you looked at how they did that, Tyrese Maxey was your backup point guard, and that's who they trusted most over Shake Milton. Now, when you bring in someone like DeAnthony Melton, who has shown that with the Memphis Grizzlies, if he's not in the starting role when John Moran is out, if it's not handed to Tyus Jones as the backup, primary backup for that Memphis Grizzlies team, then they felt comfortable uh, there and having him run the point guard position. And he did a pretty good job. So when you look at him here and, and now having an opportunity to just be the primary guy, even coming in, playing next to Maxi, playing next to uh, James Harden as well, he's going to be a guy that I see in that 20, 25 minute per night a, a game where he's going to play off ball. He's going to play on ball. You know defensively what he's like. So having him out there with someone like Matisse Thibault, that defensive presence that he has, and those two terrorizing some wings with Joel Embiid on the back end, if he's still in the game with those two players, he's going to he's going to factor in and figure in 
really well as the number one point guard. I even think Josh, he's going to be the sixth man, the first person to come off the bench, depending on, of course, what they do, whether it's Harden or Maxi coming off first. But I, I do think he's going to play a prominent role. I think he's going to be the sixth man. He's going to be the primary point guard for this basketball team. And I think it's all going to work out for the Anthony Melton. Sixer fans are going to really like him as a sixer. Yeah, he's really good. Like, And he yeah, provides good defense. He's had stretches of being a good shooter. I, I don't think that people were expecting 30 minutes for him. He's not going to get that. But yeah, 25 is absolutely within the realms of possibility. Um, PJ Tucker and Daniel House, they're going to have roles. It's not going to really translate huge amounts into fantasy. But for injuries, we're always worried about the this team. But heading into training camp, Devon, that's all clear, I believe, for injuries. Yeah, right now, the only thing that we were concerned with were the two stars and James Harden and Joel Embiid. James Harden, the unknown. Listen, Josh, we, we don't know what was going on with James Harden's hamstring. You, you know what I mean? Yeah, for, it, it for looked two like years. It was still right, for two years, hasn't really had an offseason to, to rehab it and, and get things right for him to get back to himself, albeit 32 years of age, he'll be 33 when the season uh, goes along for the 22-23 campaign. But that was one thing that we we're focused on. So far through the offseason, we haven't heard anything about surgery. We've seen him uh, working out. We've seen him doing a lot of things, basketball-related, non-basketball-related. So we have to believe, at least, Josh, that he's going to be okay as far as the hamstring. Then the other part is Joel Embiid and the injuries that he sustained in the Toronto series with the, with the torn ligaments in his thumb and then the facial fracture that he had as well. But beyond those, nothing injury-related with this basketball team. They look to be in real good health. Which is always a, an awesome thing. And we've seen so many pictures of Harden with his shirt off. I've never seen so many pictures of Harden with his shirt off, to be honest. Um, and he looks, obviously, like he's cut down a lot of weight. And we're really excited about that. We're going to talk Harden a little bit later on in the show. Before we get into that, though, a very important message. If you're hanging out with friends and you're knocking back a few drinks... Sometimes a few becomes a few too many. And as the evening comes to an end, people start to head out. And you think calling for a ride, but nah, you just live nearby. You can call it, you can make it home, day, home okay. It's no big deal. But what are the odds you get pulled over anyway? It's got to be low. Even so, what's the worst that could happen? Your insurance goes up, you lose your license, you lose your job, you total your car, you kill someone. Everyone knows about the risks of driving drunk, but the results are tragic and often deadly. However, that still doesn't stop everyone from getting behind the wheel while under the influence. That's why police officers are out there right now looking for impaired drivers on our roads to save lives. So if you think you're okay to drive after a few drinks, think again, play it safe and plan ahead to get a ride. It only takes one mistake to change your life or someone else's forever. Drive sober or get pulled over. All right, your projected starting five, Devon, again, I... This is one of those ones where no one's arguing with this. It's Harden, Maxi, Harris, Tucker, and Embiid. Um, it does put Tobias Harris in a position where he probably isn't quite as successful moving down to the three versus playing at the four. You're replacing Danny Green in that lineup. We'll talk about Harris a little bit more later, but is this an upgrade getting PJ in there uh, over Danny Green? Yes, of course, the shooting we, we know is, is something that Danny Green really thrives on, but he can be hot and cold. And, uh, when he gets hot, he's really hot. And when there are those cold times, he can, you know, freeze out uh, a team and uh, he's shooting the basketball and just can't see. It. I've seen too many times where uh, he was struggling a bit and you could just see it uh, on that second or third attempt where then we see an air ball come because he's just thinking too much. But as an overall player, we haven't really seen much of a decline defensively in P.J. Tucker, and that's what he's known for. Also, those corner three-pointers that he's very well – uh, known for also with the uh, previous years and with Houston and Milwaukee and, and latest being Miami, he can knock down a corner three. So if you're looking for PJ Tucker to give you the point production and, and have that impact offensively, then that's the wrong idea because we know it all belongs. It all starts and ends with his energy level on the defensive end, uh, how much he digs in on that end of the floor makes the opposition work. And Danny Green was a good defender. He was a very good at this stage of his career, good team defender, and he had some really good moments. He had some legs left where he could still be an individual out there on the floor that can hold his own and, and have some key stops, get some blocks here and there. But I do think it is an upgrade uh, with P.J. Tucker. And we've seen over the last two seasons with both Milwaukee and Miami where he has been a, a, an integral part of what they've done to get to the championship level and win for Milwaukee and an Eastern Conference final for P.J. Tucker, and we saw that all too well here in Philadelphia where they uh, went through the six games that they did with the Miami Heat where he was picking guys up 94 feet. He was giving James Harden trouble, but they had to take the ball out of his hands and allow to buy Tyrese Maxey 
to bring the ball up the floor. And sometimes Tobias Harris as well. Every now and again, Joel Embiid, just because he did not allow the offense to initiate and get started with James Harden. So I do think it's an upgrade. I, I love the addition of P.J. Tucker, and he adds toughness, Josh, to this team that lacks that and has lacked that for the last few years since the exit of Mike Scott, if you will. Oh, yeah. yeah, and 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 this is one that, that he brings there. He brings a little bit of that dog and that toughness here with this basketball team. So I do think it was an upgrade. Danny Green was good here for the Sixers for the two years that he suited up in the uh, red, white, and blue. But now with P.J. Tucker, I do think uh, it brings a different type of of addition to this basketball team that will help out. In terms of the bench group, we've got De'Anthony Melton, Daniel House, Matisse Thibel, George Niang, and, and Paul Reed. And Paul Reed's the interesting one because they mucked around. Well, that Andre Drummond was pretty good as a backup, and they inexplicably were using DeAndre Jordan last season. Reed played games in the playoffs, played well. I think whoever they use, whether it is Reed or Bassey, as you've already mentioned, is a significant upgrade over Jordan. I agree that Reed will be the guy that gets that first crack at things, and that's someone that people who are in fantasy leagues, when Embiid does sit down, if Reed is starting, he, he puts up numbers. We saw it again, Devon, in Summer League this season, that he puts up big numbers whenever he's on the court. Is Doc really ready to, to trust him in this like every-night role, do you think? I don't think so. Uh, as a, Well, again, to start, as you mentioned, to start, he'll get the first crack over Paul Reed. He'll get that. He got the nod in the postseason uh, against the more athletic, faster teams where DeAndre Jordan, he got the uh, the other opportunities uh, in, in round number one. I mean, not necessarily round number one. But they tried it against Miami, but it was more Paul Reed in round one against the Toronto Raptors, as it should have been. And that's one of the things that Paul Reed talked about in his exit interview with the media. Josh, where he, he mentioned how the one thing that he really wants to do is just continue to gain the trust of Doc Rivers. Doc Rivers seemingly with the time here with us in Philadelphia doesn't seem to lean on those young players too much. Tyrese Maxey was out of a necessity and it worked, but we have not seen Isaiah Joe enough where we've felt if we've seen Joe, Reed, and even Bassey during the regular season, maybe those minutes will then translate and help out a little bit more once the postseason comes. Uh, but right now, Reed is going to get those minutes. And I wouldn't also ignore this part, too, that maybe they'll also look for, as things have now cleared up a little bit with the Kevin Durant situation, not that it really has put things on hold, but a veteran big man to come in just in case the young players are not ready behind Joel Embiid in that event. But Reed, yes, will get the – I think Reed will get the nod right now, working hard. He's been working with some of the vets. Tobias Harris, James Harden. Uh, Bassey also was working with James Harden. So we'll see. But I think Reed gets the nod right now. I, I like both of those guys as backup centers. There are some interesting backup centers available on the market. One yeah. of those is Hassan Whiteside. Tristan Thompson is still available. Not that they're great, but you're yeah, feeling that sort of role that they're better than what DeAndre Jordan was giving down the, the stretch. And they could be options, but I, I like to see or hope that they give Reed that little bit of an opportunity. We want to talk about younger guys and Doc Rivers not trusting them. Jaden Springer was drafted in the first round last season. I, rightfully so, he didn't play because I don't think he was, he, I don't think he played very well. He's still not even 20 in his second season. Uh, is there any hope you can give? Like, not that he's going to play this season, just for his long-term career. Because I, I didn't really think in the opportunities we saw, and even his G League stuff, I, I don't think he looked particularly good. Not offensively. Yeah, that wasn't his, his strong suit. Still working on that as a young player, as you said. Uh, 19 years of age he's going to be. And what it is for him, and Doc Rivers spoke about this at the end of the season uh, with his exit interview with the media, that right now he feels like Jaden Springer, if called upon, for year number two could probably step in and play some defensive minutes, but we didn't see it. We didn't, we didn't see them giving him that opportunity down the stretch when the G league season was, was wrapped up. He was with the big club and never, he got into some, some, some minutes at the end of the games where the game was out of hand and the game was already done. And you, you know how you go deeper into your bench and just allow them to get some minutes and playoff minutes, some opportunities, some, some experience, but I don't know because the offense does have to catch up. He is one that physically, once it starts to build up, Josh, he does look like he can be a defensive player in this league. It's about the offense. Will that be able to catch up? And can he be a contributor in that way to this basketball team? So he is a mystery. I do think he's going to spend a lot of time again with the Delaware Bluecoats in the G League. But I, I will be paying attention a lot more in year number two because they've hit on some of these picks in the 20s. Matisse Thibel, Tyrese Maxey, and Jaden Springer was one of them. And there were players around him that had some success in year number one. Uh, will he be one that takes the next step in year number two, or is it going to take longer? 
Let's talk about Tyrese Maxey a little bit now. It seems pretty obvious that he is the third offensive option ahead of Tobias Harris. So let's just yeah, roll these two guys into this one question. Yeah, How much of a step back do you think Harris is going to take? And when Harris does take that step back, what else does he offer? And it is it clear that Maxey is that third offensive option? I think it is clear. And it's funny because when J.J. Redick and Jimmy Butler left with Ben Simmons still here and Tobias Harris was the second option offensively, even though Simmons was the point guard and he uh, operated a lot of things there and he would still give you 16, 17 points uh, a night. Tobias Harris uh, was the number two scoring option behind Joel Embiid. And he averaged 18 a night and he can do that. He's a professional scorer in the way that he does it. Not Kevin Durant like, but he's a professional scorer where he's going to give you 18 a night. And the thing that it would always get me, I can't speak for everybody else here in Philadelphia, but he is a, a, a lightning rod here in town is he has the potential to give you 22 a night. Now, is that because of maybe his lack of diversity offensively, or is that because everything runs through Joel and beat first and foremost, but uh, sometimes I thought it was Harris because he, he, as good as he is, you know, sometimes it seems like he he's going to give you this and then he caps out. Uh, or when he gave you maybe 25, it wasn't impactful. Right, Josh. And, to the fantasy point, you know, you see it, all you care about are the numbers and all, you want to put them up. But uh, when, when you're talking about wins and maybe having to ha- have that heavy load if Embiid is having an off night or Simmons is not scoring at that time, uh, he was the number two. And now he's going from two to four because of Maxi's ascension as a, as a scoring player in this league, the downhill nature of his game, but then extending his range out to three-point range where Josh, he finished third in the NBA, 42.5% from beyond. And a lot of looks and comfortably taking these shots now. And and I think that Maxi has, you know, that now in his in his repertoire of scoring. And Harris is probably, I don't know, because gives you 18 easy. Is that gonna drop to 15? Yeah, is it gonna I drop it to is. You, you know you know what I mean? Yeah. It's going to be interesting to see. Uh, Maxie's, we'll talk about Maxie in a second, but Harris, like I talk about this on the show all the time, he's just, he's just boring. Like it's just, what he does, he might give you 20, but it's the most boring 20 that you'd get. Like he's not- out, That's why I talk about the impact, he, right? He's not hitting threes. He's not doing big plays. He's not passing. He's not def- He's defending okay and he's scoring okay. Like everything's just okay. It's just boring. Like give me something, give me some bursts. There's nothing. Whereas Maxie, like it's bloody exciting. Like he pushes to the rim, he goes hard. He's hitting these threes at this crazy rate. Like everything was exciting about what he did. And he is pushed clear. Now I want to do. I want to talk about Maxi and the shooting because he was insane. Like forty three percent from three, it was at forty five percent over the second half of the season as well. And something I stress on this show all the time is that when someone has absolute outlier top one or two in the NBA numbers, you got to expect something to come down. Because Tyrese Maxi shot. Where's the number? 20%, I think, is a or 30% from three as a rookie. That is a gigantic step up. I don't believe anybody is a consistent long term forty five or forty three percent three point shooter. So. I would expect some of that to regress back, even if the theory can be, oh, he's going to get more open looks because Harden's going to be hit, kicking out to him. Just, it's really hard. Like, you know, JJ Redick was there. It's really hard to have 43% shooting from three for multiple years, especially when you don't have a track, re- track record as being that sort of a level of a shooter. The thing that was surprising about Maxi was early on, as you talk about his rookie season, shooting in the 30s, and sometimes with the form shooting and how he shot it, it looked like it wasn't going to go in. It may have been a little bit flat as well but uh not a lot of attempts in year one and year number two the attempts were much better the attempts were different two different varieties they were a uh, pull up in transition catch and shoot in transition off the bounce in the half court set step backs so josh he was taking a lot of difficult shots when we were like oh tyree slow down a little bit that's not you yet but as we went along and even in the playoffs we learned that that was him it's not going to stay at 42 and a half percent it should drop down to about 38, 39%, or maybe even lower league average around 36, 37. However, we are now comfortable watching him shoot three pointers because it does seem like that's who he is. I just recently went to one of the pro-ams here, the, the pro-am here in town uh, two weeks back, and he played in the championship game with the Mars twins, Markeith and Marcus, you know, of course, Clippers and Heat, and Markeith is actually a free agent. Maybe that's the Sixers option, but uh, he played on their team with Isaiah Joe, and a lot of what he was doing, of course, he can get to the basket at will, was taking those three. So you know he's working on those things. That's where he is. Uh, for him to to take that leap, take that step as a three-point shooter in just year number two, where the minutes increased dramatically from year number one, where the coach, to your point earlier with the young players, 
didn't even trust him no. uh, a lot. And year number two, the guy has now put himself in a position to be the number three scorer on a playoff team, a championship contender, and shooting at a high clip. So if he can put all that stuff together and keep it going, shooting around that 38, 39% clip uh, for year number three, we're talking about a, a budding star level player in, in this league. One of the things that's really interesting here is that he just he didn't take many threes either, and that gives me an extra level of skepticism. He only took four a game, and he, if you're hitting at 43%, I'd like you to be hitting more than at least two per game. Is at 1.8. That did increase as the season went on, so he did start to learn. And I think we see more volume from him and more danger from him out there, but I, I do see some sort of a drop off in that three point uh, three point percentage because it is hard to maintain that, and especially when you're doing it on on low volume, which he was. It wasn't like he wasn't bombing. It wasn't hitting 11 11 per 36 like Isaiah Joe Chuck up like he's just chucking them all the time that wasn't that isn't Maxi's game and it wasn't uh or it's not going to be his game as we move forward we do have more stuff to talk about Devon before we do that going to talk about betonline.net the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your betting needs my Miami Dolphins Devon have got the Philadelphia Eagles this week in the NFL preseason are you an Eagles fan yeah, I grew up born and raised in Philadelphia. So, yeah, the Eagles, that was the squad. So, uh, while the Dolphins are favored on Bet Online for this preseason game, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bet that the Philadelphia uh, Eagles have the, uh, the better record in the regular season because they look like they're in pretty good position. But if you want to know all about the odds for any NFL game, any Major League Baseball game, the NBA, NHL, combat sports, esports, or even golf, Bet Online has everything you need. From live in game betting, scores, and podcasts, they have you covered. So, head to Bet Online today or use your mobile device to learn more about the action that is happening today. Bet Online is where the game starts. All right. Over the last couple of seasons, Devon, Joel Embiid has made absolutely zero secret about the fact that he wants to win the MVP. It has not happened for two straight years. Um, some may say, and I think oh, maybe I'm misremembering this. I, I, I get the feeling that at some point Embiid has said, yeah, I was actually trying to bump some of my numbers up because I wanted that MVP. Um, do you think that we see him saying, well, we've seen the sacrifice from Harden financially that Embiid's like, but would... That's secondary now. I've tried it. I don't care. It's all about the title now. Do you think there'll be any change in his game? Because his usage is absolutely through the roof. And I've got a number about that later on we're going to talk about. Is he still hyper-focused on MVP? Or have we got a little bit of a different focus now? I believe it's going to be a different focus. Uh, he wasn't always just focused on the MVP. He always, while you remember the MVP quote, uh, where he said, of course, he may have tried to do a little bit more to to win that award. He always, always, Josh, talks about winning a championship. And uh, I, I think now, though, he will move past the MVP conversation. And one of the things that I do back and beat on a lot when I hear national people, not yourself, but national people talk about how he's so focused on the MVP is what people don't realize is he's asked about it. And he's one of the more honest people when it comes to answering questions. He's thoughtful. He takes his time. And he gives you what he says. And Yes, he wants to win the MVP, but he never brings it up. He's asked the question. And when we talk about players in any sport, not answering questions when the media asks, we can't have it both ways. And he was honest about wanting to win while also winning the championship. So, but I do think after now, these two seasons where he was more, more than uh, worthy of winning that award, he is going to move past it where it won't be something that we hear talked about a lot this upcoming season it's going to be about the mvp i mean the, the championship and you just talked about the sacrifice that was made from james harden and others he is going to be focused in my belief of winning a championship once again not the mvp yeah that's a, okay he had 36 usage last season i that, that can't go up and i think it's going to come down how far it comes down I, I don't know but that is something to to monitor he did take some really really huge steps up in that over the last couple of years. So just people who are looking to draft him, just be aware of that. And the other big name that we're going to talk about here is James Harden, who still put up pretty... Like for any other player, like these are good numbers. Like 22, 8, and 10, like they're really good numbers for anyone else. And people look at him and James Harden go, well, he's washed, he's cooked, the hamstrings bothered him, he's 30, he's just turned 33, all that sort of stuff. But one of the big things that was the issue with it, um, Devon was finishing at the rim because it was really bad. He was in the 12th percentile on the NBA at rim finishing at 53%. Back in his peak, he was hitting them at 63%. 53 is an extraordinarily low number. How much of that is, do you think the extra weight he was carrying the adjustment to the um, shooting foul rules, the hamstring injury, age. Could we see that all this stuff just sort of revert and he goes back, not even to 63%, but look, league average for a guard, 57, 58% at the rim. Was there, or do you think he's just, he just can't do it anymore? 
I think it was a combination of everything that you mentioned, but I do think he can get better at it, even at this age. And and hopefully the hamstring is right where he's able to go and he's healthy from the start. I, but one of the issues that I had with him, uh, Josh, was that we've seen James Harden finish at the rim with one of the best in the NBA yep. and get the and ones, get to the line, make convert his free throws. My thought process, and I apologize to any Sixer fans who may be watching us here on this fantasy preview, the season preview on the fantasy uh, basketball, locked on fantasy basketball, because I've said this over and over again during the season when I first noticed it throughout the playoffs and at the end of the campaign. He tried to finish like he was still Houston James Harden, where he had that lift, where he had that explosion to the rim, where that was just not the case for whatever reason. Age, foul rule changed, hamstring, whatever it was, Josh, he was not the same to be able to do that. And the same went for the step back threes. So if you don't have your legs that way, you can't do it the same. So you have to adjust as a high-level player, as he called himself in his introductory press conference with him and Embiid figuring out two high-level basketball players, figuring it out. As a high-level player that that you are and still possess those skills, you have to adjust to who you are in that moment for your team to win. And I thought too many times he tried to still finish second and worried about – you know, finishing at that point second and get to the foul line like he used to instead of finishing first, absorb that contact, get the foul call, and get to the free throw line. That has to be an adjustment that he makes again this year until we see that he can finish it the way that he used to as a Houston Rocket. And the same goes for those step-back threes where we saw them too flat too many times during the season. Take some of those mid-range, step-backs. Those those count too, and then eventually – as the game goes along, you'll feel more comfortable stepping back. So I think it was a combination of all those things, and I hope he adjusts to what he is for this upcoming campaign, whatever it is. He's a guy that for the last six seasons, his effective field goal percentage was 53, 54, 54, 54, 55, and then 48. So he fell off everywhere. Like, he couldn't finish at the rim. His mid-range has dropped by 10 percentage points. He lost three percentage points on his threes. Um, he, he improved his free throws. But, like, all these other shooting numbers fell off. And maybe that's age-related. Maybe he's just done. Maybe that never comes back. But he had such a track record of being solidly good in those areas that I do think there is some bounce-back ability here for Harden. Who do you think Agreed. is a breakout candidate on this team, Devon? We had Maxi last season. Is there anyone that you can see breaking out this season? Well, if, if I were to if I were to choose one since you put me on the spot, uh, wow, I, I, Paul Reed, I guess would be it. Yeah, that probably has Paul, to be him. Paul Reed would be it. I, I I so want to go with Isaiah Joe, who we didn't mention as one of the younger players on on the graphic there, but I, I would have to go Paul Reed taking that next step from year two to three, where he may be the primary backup. He gets more consistent minutes. He's trusted out there on the floor, not just from his coach but his teammates and his activity. Uh, both playing the four and the five, what he's able to do out there. Because that was one of the things that I wanted to see a little bit more was maybe a couple of minutes with Joel Embiid while he played the four, depending on the matchups. But if I would look at one and answering your question, I would say it would be Paul Reed as a primary backup at the five, maybe some four minutes, improve his outside shooting, hopefully, and just being a trustworthy player out there on the floor. What about the other side of things, a regression candidate? Man. Um, wow, that's a good one. I wonder if it would be George Niang, George Niang, just because of, of what the others are now around him, where we, where we look at, maybe he doesn't get as many minutes, uh, maybe he doesn't get as many shots because he, who he's out there with. Uh, but when he is out there with James Harden and Joel Embiid, he's a prime candidate as one of the better shooters on this basketball team for what he was able to do. And he was de- dealt with some injuries with his knees at the latter part of the season going into the playoffs and he really couldn't hit shots like he did during the regular season. So uh, maybe he's one of them. I, I would, I would hope that he would bounce back with the same type of regular season and hold up for the postseason. But if I were to say one, it would be him just because of the minutes that others would get and take away from a possibly like Daniel house. Yeah, Niang also shot over 40% from three last season, so you, you think that that's probably going to come, come down. This is an easy, straightforward question. Is this team better than last season? I do believe so. They're deeper. Uh, they're better. James Harden, you get to start with him from the beginning of the season. Ben Simmons was on the bench, uh, not really a part of the team. So uh, you, you take that right now, knowing that your, your second best player, to your point, averaged 22-10 and close to eight rebounds 
and it was looked at as a down year. Yeah. And if uh, if you bring that back with Joel Embiid, it's, it's second year, second in year in a row as a runner up for the MVP, and improved Tyrese Maxey year number three. Tobias Harris knows his role, played very well, most consistent in my opinion, in the playoffs. And then you add the bench depth that you do have. They are better in my opinion, and they finished fourth, uh, tied for five, tied for second in the Eastern Conference with Boston and Milwaukee. I think they are better than they were a season ago. I think they are too. Who's the most likely player to be traded on this team? Tobias Harris. Okay. Uh, Tobias Harris. Finding that yeah. deal is going to be tough given the amount of money left on his deal, but I, I agree he is that guy, unless it's like something small, like maybe now, an, an Isaiah Joe I, deal. Or Thibault. I would mention oh, Thibault. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Of course, he's another one. Um, All right, let's finish this off, Devon, with some quiz questions. This is something I've been asking all the hosts coming on. We're using the the talent grades that are listed over at Basketball Index for three categories, three-point shooting talent, playmaking talent, and finishing talent for players who finish this season on the Sixers roster. The three-point shooting talent is not necessarily who had the highest percentage, so we're not necessarily talking about you know, George and Yang up there, but like volume, pull-ups are more difficult than contested, um, location of threes, the volume of threes. You know, who would have graded out as the best three-point shooter? Same with playmaking. It's not just about assists. It's about the volume of passes, the versatility of passes. Are you getting guys open? Are you, you know, getting assists um, in high-value situations? And finishing is not just about getting putbacks. It's about driving to the rim as well and, and getting finishing through contact. So... Saying all of that, who do you think would have graded out as the highest three-point shooting talent on this team last season? Wow. And that's even with the players that are no longer here. Um, uh, not, not including those guys because the, the, oh, it, it was Seth Curry. But okay. yeah, he's not, okay. he's not here. Okay. Because I, he I was even thinking Danny Green is no longer there. Um, I'll, go with, uh, I'll go with Tyrese Maxey. It was actually James Harden because of what we referenced earlier, just how few Tyrese actually took. And okay. just, there just wasn't that many of them there. Um, the playmaking one, who do you reckon that would have been? James Harden. Yeah, it's obviously James Harden, that one. And this one here, finishing. So we're talking about getting to the rim, finishing at the rim, whether that is a, a big man or a guard. And who do you think would grade as the best finisher on this squad? Ah. Uh. I want to say Embiid, but I'm going to go Maxi. It is Tyrese Maxi. He did grade out as the best finisher. It's and we've got one, one, one more question. The three main guys on this team, Joel Embiid, James Harden, and Tyrese Maxi played 795 minutes together in the regular season and playoffs last season. Um, it, I've worded this question incorrectly, but I'll, I'll tell you what it is. Not including Embiid, all right? Harden and Maxi, between those two, which player had more true shooting attempts during that time on court? I would say, well, I would say Maxi because I would take away from the free throw attempts that the other two had, and you excluded Embiid. I'm gonna go Maxi. True shooting attempts includes free throws, so if, every, ah, every so two, free, yeah, so free every, every two free throw counts as basically a field goal. Uh, I'll, I'll go with Harden. It was James Harden, barely 301 versus 297, ah. and. Interestingly, in these minutes that they played, Embiid had a 35 usage, Harden had 20, and Maxi had a 17% usage in the minutes they shared. So there was a pretty clear hierarchy in terms of how often he was getting the ball. It wasn't a huge amount. And we'll see if that changes this season because that is something to watch for. People are expecting, a lot of fantasy people are expecting Maxi to take another step forward. And I'm not sure it's going to be as easy for him to do that with a full season of Harden next to him. But we will find that out very, very soon. We're 50-odd days away from the start of the NBA season. Devon, thank you for coming on and chatting about the Sixers. What's happening at Locked On Sixers at the moment? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Keith and I are just diving into the summer a, a little bit and uh, uh, picking our spots with certain things. Three days a week right now with things slowing down and ready to pick it up uh, in September. So, uh, yeah, so we, we, we have everything covered. And uh, tomorrow, I already know, or, pardon me, on Wednesday, I already know that we're going to be talking about the Kevin Durant part of it and how this now affects the 76ers as is. Well, check that out. Check out Locked On Sixers wherever you find podcasts and on YouTube. Devon, thanks for coming on Locked On Fantasy Basketball with me. Josh, thank you for having me, man. That was a blast. And that will do it for me today. Don't forget to follow this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and on the Odyssey app. If you are here on YouTube, thumb it up and leave those comments down below, guys. We are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. Say so, yeah.